It was Harry's commitment and vision, as Peter Clinton and I would know um, many years ago, that led to the establishment of this fantastic organisation. Uh, he was the inaugural chairman of the Harry Perkins Institute. In those days, it was called the Western Australian Institute for Medical Research. He was the chairman from 1998 to 2002, when he was tragically um, cut down by lung cancer, never smoked a cigarette in his life, unfortunately, uh, and he died in 2002. And we renamed the Institute um, in 2013, uh, the Harry Perkins Institute, in honour of Harry. He was, and I'm sure Jane um, will tell us a little bit more about that, but he was a farmer from Bruce Rock and he wanted to be known as a farmer from Bruce Rock. Uh, he had an incredibly distinguished career, being the uh, chairman of West Farmers for about 16 years. He was Chancellor of Curtin and he was here for five years as the chairman of uh, the Harry Perkins Institute. And if he could be with us, I think he would be incredibly proud of what's been achieved over the last 25 years. Um, uh, I'm sure he'd be wrapped. We've got more than 650 researchers, staff and students. That includes about 200 uh, people who are incredibly committed working in linear clinical research, our clinical research facility, our early stage um, clinical trials facility. We also have a wonderful West Farmers, um, I should say Lottery West funded uh, Biodiscovery Centre where the newest, brightest ideas uh, in biomedical research are shared with some of our youngest people and and Hannah Allen, who's going to present one of the uh, medals later on uh, tonight, uh, is a member of that this prestigious group who have had the experience of being in the Perkins and giving STEM experience to young people. Jane, it is a wonderful opportunity to invite you up to tell us a little bit about your dad, how you saw him, what he did for the Harry Perkins Institute. So please join with me in welcoming Dr Jane Allen to the stage who will tell us a little bit about Harry Perkins AO. Good evening. I'm going to start tonight not talking about Dad, but Dad's dad or grandpa. I never met the man. He was the member for York and his maiden speech in Parliament was the importance of a, was campaigning for free public libraries. He was also a member of the board of West Farmers. He said why, on many occasions, I gather, I never heard, um, that he did more good for his local community as a member of West Farmers board than he did as a, as a politician on the back benches. I don't know, I'd love to ask him, does he think that a public radio station is more important than public libraries? Or what was it? But there was many a project in where, that West Farmers helped create for our community. We come forward to 1974. Grandpa has died, Dad is running the farm, he's very busy with our young family, people like me, and he's approached to join the board of West Farmers. And he said to Mum, doesn't really work for our family, but this is an opportunity I can't say no to. And so he took on a membership of the Board of West Farmers and he had a number of, like Grandpa, passion projects of what can we do to change the community through running West Farmers. At the time, West Farmers was changing from a farmers cooperative to a public company, but it was still that ethos of what's good for the West Australian community and the general Australian community as it grew. He had, did lots of things, but one of his most passionate projects was when the two Peters came knocking on his door in the late 90s and said, we want to create a, an inst medical research in, institute in WA. Dad had a history in farming communities and knew that if the local town lost its doctor, the town died, literally and figuratively. And he realised that if WA didn't have a medical research institute, 
we wouldn't have top medical researchers or top medical practitioners in WA. And to get cutting edge treatment, you would have to leave Perth, which is not something we wanted to do. He was known at the time, Mum heard, overheard him a couple of times on the phone saying, it's okay, I'm not ringing to hassle you about Weimar. I wanted to talk to you about something else. He became totally um, passionate about Weimar, as the two Peters can talk to. And yes, so I will leave it at that and talk happily for many hours about what a passionate man he was. But his twin, Peter Clinkin, <laughs> is the star of tonight. And so I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Um, and what an incredible legacy. This is really, um, it's an opportunity to be involved in something from the beginning. And Peter, um, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity, actually, 25 years ago. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce someone I've known for yonks. Uh, since 1994, when we both came back from the US together. We didn't know each other at all. Peter became the professor of clinical biochemistry at UWA and I was a senior lecturer of medicine at Royal Perth and someone said, Peter Liebman, you should introduce yourself to Peter Clinkin. So I went down to the biochemistry department uh, and within, within a, a very short time, one, we became great friends and two, we realised that, that Western Australia needed a medical research institute. We didn't have one and we'd both come from very substantial organisations um, and we just needed to uh, convince just a few other people that we needed a few hundred million dollars to build the building. Um, but my job here tonight is to introduce Peter, and I will over the next few minutes, because it is a pleasure. Um, and remember that Peter is our chief scientist uh, and has been given many accolades, and I'll just mention just a few and embarrass him a little bit uh, in a few moments. Peter was integral in establishing uh, Weimar, as it was then, in 1998, and became its first director. Um, and of course, Weimar became Perkins. Peter is a passionate man. And if, for those of you who know him, he loves a joke, he, he loves life to bits, and he's passionate. And his passion and drive to help secure the $200 million to build the building, this building being one of them, and the southern building down at Murdoch, um, was um, insatiable. It was wonderful. No, nothing would stop uh, Peter Clinkin, uh, and there was often two steps forward and one step back. It was very challenging indeed. So he was incredibly involved in the design and the delivery of both of the buildings, uh, and what a superb uh, design they have been. You were visionary, Peter. The idea of bringing together pockets of people all over Perth into one simple, single location seems simple in principle, but it's really hard to do. And we are all the better for your persistence and persistence um, through those heady days. Apart from the obvious cost efficiencies of co-locating research, it meant that there was collaborations that were happening that were never happening previously. And there is a south and a north part of this town, south of the river and north of the river, and believe it or not, uh, that was preventing all sorts of uh, wonderful advancements in science uh, from happening. And bringing them all together in two locations under one umbrella had an incredible impact. Just to give you a little flavour of some of the things that the, the Institute is involved in now, because tonight it's for Peter to talk, but I'll just give you a little bit of a taster. We have the Australian Cancer Research Foundation Centre for Advanced Cancer Genomics, where Professor Alistair Forrest leads a consortium of, of uh, cancer researchers, and they're building comprehensive uh, atlases of cancer cells uh, in various tumours. The Medical Research Future Fund gave Associate Professor Gina Ravenscroft almost $5 million to lead a team of 10 other uh, uh, young gung-ho scientists 
to understand and deliver the causes of several rare and devastating genetic diseases. One of our biomedical engineers, uh, um, uh, Elena Juan Pardo, is working closely with a cardiologist to develop world best 3D printed aortic valves using a very novel technology. Uh, and that's at the, it really is a world first in that area. Uh, Professor Juliana Hamza is developing her discovery of the world's first drug that dissolves plaque in your coronary arteries, and we hope that comes to fruition as very quickly, obviously. And there's many more things I could talk about tonight, just to give you a little taste tester of some, and a flavour of some of the remarkable discoveries and um, uh, research endeavours that are happening because we are, are all now uh, in these two beautiful buildings. Peter is our chief scientist. He's our third chief scientist of Western Australia, and the chief scientist was established in 2003. He provides independent scientific advice on whole of government science and technology strategies to ensure that our politicians are well, well educated when they're making decisions about science in their portfolios and in, the, in government. So it's an incredibly important position. Peter's background prior to becoming uh, the chief scientist, he was a very well known and established scientist in his own right. He was involved and his lab was involved in making fundamental discoveries in leukaemia, cancer and anemia. He, as I said, was awarded many, uh, has been awarded many accolades. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences in 2015 a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering in 2016, appointed a companion of the Order of Australia, an AC, the highest award that anyone can be uh, awarded in this country in 2017. Uh, and among many of Peter's accomplishments um, was his involvement in the COVID-19 pandemic, where he provided very important and concise information uh, to government, academia and industry, and for that we're very grateful. So Peter Clinton is an amazing man. He's done incredible things in his life and he's still working like crazy. Mind you, I, he did say he was on the Bilberman track when I rang him last week, um, so he knows how to enjoy life and have the occasional, just the occasional glass of wine as well. But Peter, it is a pleasure to have you here after 25 years. The title of your talk is WA The Destination State. Please welcome Professor Peter Clinkin, AC, to give his oration. That's the longest intro I've ever had, let me tell you. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you all for coming along tonight. <laughs> Seriously, Pete. Um, what, what an honour and what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. In this great auditorium, the McCusker Auditorium. Most casters aren't here tonight, are they? I'll, I'll, I'll share a story then. Uh, I can remember when we were fundraising uh, for this building. Um, on a Friday afternoon, I was just driving back and I, the phone rings and you know, you're driving, right? You're driving and your phone goes off and it's Tonya McCusker. And you think, should I take this call or should I stop? Or quickly pulled over and Tonya says, oh, Pete, um, how's the building plans going? I said, fantastic, Tonya, really great, thank you. Um, have you got an auditorium in there? And I said, Tonya, that's the one thing we haven't got because, you know, given the constraints of the building, etc., etc., we haven't got an auditorium. She said, would you like one? <laughs> I just, you know, my jaw dropped, bounced off the, you know, the, the steering wheel a couple of times, and she said, we'll fund it. So if you look at this building, the McCusker Auditorium actually comes out from the main part of the building because of that decision from the McCuskers that evening. It was just, you know, one of those moments you remember. So uh, if you see Tonya and Malcolm, thank them on our behalf. Um, I would just like to start, like I always do, um, by acknowledging the traditional owners here and sort of, with your permission, Shaz, uh, I try to say a few words in Noongar. Uh, I sometimes make a few bloopers, like, I'll own up to one right now where I said at times, Nunga Karak, 
Nija Buja Kayaku. And what I've tried to say is the Noongar people have always been the carers of this land. And I said, Noongar Karada, Nija Buja Kayaku. And I said, the Noongar people have always been the Goannas of this land. <laughs> <laughs> so, so please excuse my uh, misinterpretations or whatever. Kai Mudich Bridia Yoga. Kwabirak Wangan, Nija Kedlak. Thank you. Beautiful speech. Kai Mudich Bridi Marman, Kai Nunakot. Nunakot Nija. Nunga Buja, Nija Wajak Nunga Buja, Nan Kadich Nunga Bridi Mamma Bridi Yoga Kura Kura, Wayaye. So, everybody, this is the land of the Nunga people. We're on the land of the Wajak clan. There are 14 clans, at least 14 clans, in the Nunga nation, and I acknowledge their elders past and present. Nyan Jinang Bula Murich Babin Nija Kedalak. So I can see lots of good friends here tonight. It's a pleasure to be back in this environment and amongst friends. Nuna court, nyan court chirp chirp nija kedalak. My heart's really happy tonight. Nyan kart nyet mindich. My head's a little bit, mm, eh. At least I haven't gone to the stage of calling myself kite warrior. Oh, so it's, he's a little bit nuts, right? <laughs> so I'm forgiven for that. Okay. So you know, as Shaz said, it's just such a pleasure to, to share the stage with you, Shaz. Thank you. You you're just such a beautiful person, and you just present such a beautiful message. And we are really privileged to be able to share this land with people who've been living here for sixty thousand years. I've got a place down near the Margaret River area. And God, this could go on forever. I mean, seriously. Do you want to bring the wine in now and we can just sort of <laughs> settle? Um, but I go down there every Thursday night and come back on Sunday afternoon to see my grandkids. Um, but I'm very close to a cave in Warandi Buja, which is the saltwater people's area. And that place is called Devil's Lair. And Devil's Lair is it's not just a winery, folks, OK? It's not just a winery. Devil's Lair is a cave where there is the oldest remnants of a campfire anywhere in Australia and probably in the world. It goes back 40,800 years, right? And in the corner of that cave, they found little stone tools that were 48,000 years old. You know, you're just going, wow. You imagine what those people were thinking sitting around a fire 40,000 years ago. Just incredible. So it's a pleasure that we, it's a privilege for us to be able to share this land with such an ancient heritage. And I say, we build on 60,000 years of knowledge. The Aboriginal people were the original scientists. They knew the plants, the birds, the slugs, the trees, the, the stars, and they brought it all together in this beautiful, beautiful story, weaving the dreaming together with their song lines. Everything was beautifully integrated. And we've got so much to learn. So thank you. All right, a um, couple of things. Correction for Peter Liebman when he said we raised $200 million for the two. I could see Peter Leonard up there. He, know, he was a money man. He knew how much we actually. We, we raised $200 million, Pete, you're right, but we put it in the bank. And we actually ended up with $230 million because we invested it well. <laughs> so we had a bigger, an even bigger building. Um, Jane, I wasn't Harry's twin. I was his Siamese twin. <laughs> so Harry, Harry and I, uh, you know, we, we used up a whole lot of shoe leather going around knocking on doors trying to raise money to set up Waymer back in the late 90s. And I, I'll never forget this day, we had a really tough meeting in Fremantle Hospital who were not too thrilled with these, you know, people from the other side of town who had actually crossed over, you know, the, the, to the, the bridge without getting the passport stamped, you know. Anyone from Frio here? That's okay then. Oh, I'm sorry to insult you. Um, but so we're in the car park and we go, well, that was a bit of a tough meeting, right? And <laughs> Harry said to me, Pete, you know, you and I, we're like Siamese twins. You know, we're joined at the hip. We're going around and we're doing this together. And at that time, there was this movie out called Twins. Do you remember it? <laughs> so I said to Harry, okay, who's Arnold Schwarzenegger? Who's Danny DeVito? <laughs> 
Um, we never ever resolved that, um, but it was, a, it was a magic moment that I always remember. Um, Harry was a wonderful guy to work with. He taught me so much, and it was just a privilege to sit at Harry's feet and to absorb by osmosis the wisdom that, it, that, that just came out of him. He was just a wonderful man. So, Jane, thank you for your introduction and to have the family here. Uh, it's, just, it's just wonderful. You know you're getting old when you get asked to do an oration. I've never done an oration before, right? So this must be important, um, I think. <laughs> um, I, I guess I better start. Um, we've only got another two hours to go, haven't we? <laughs> Sorry, it was a, a, bit, a bit less. All right, okay. Um, I, okay, where are we? Here. Ooh, okay, we're on. Okay, time to put on the game face. Mm, let's get serious. Um, so after I uh, stepped down from uh, the, 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 the role in Perkins and Pete took over in 2014, I went back to doing research and it was a blast. I was having a ball doing all sorts of research and getting back to, you know, the, the inner geek was coming out again. Um, and I got this tap on the shoulder to, to be the chief scientist of Western Australia. And uh, people ask me if I enjoy it and I tell them I don't. And it's because I love it. It's just such a rare privilege to be in a position to provide advice to government. And so my role, uh, let me look at here, is that I provide advice to the government. It's independent. Um, so I'm not, very importantly, I don't speak for the government. I'm not part of the government. I'm also not a public servant, even though there are some public servants in the audience or ex-public servants in the audience. I will not say anything derogatory. I'm not part of industry and not part of academia. So I've stepped out. I'm essentially a consultant advisor to the government. And really just remember, I don't speak for the government. These are just my crazy thoughts that are up here. My job is to try and grow the scientific economy and to make WA a better place. And so that last bit at the bottom, special issues important to the future of WA, is where I take a lot of license. And I go into areas that might not be strictly science. And I try to provide advice uh, to government in areas that I think are of real importance to our state, and not just right now, but into the future for our kids, our grandkids, and their kids. Okay, so bottom line is we're in a, a, a global battle for talent. Anyone knows that right now? I have a very simple mantra which says that bright people come up with bright ideas. And there's a, there's a guy, an, an American who actually has moved to uh, Canada called Richard Florida, who came up with a thing called the, the Global Creativity Index. And he measures three things, talent, that's me, okay, get that. Technology and tolerance. And the, the, the tolerance is a really interesting one there. Because why tolerance? Because he said there is this group of people called, that he calls the creative class. He says that the fastest growing group globally who go to areas where they feel their values are aligned, they feel valued for what they're doing, and they're highly mobile. And so the thesis of this talk is about how do you attract, how do you retain the creative class. These are the people who are going to make the big discoveries and the big changes to our society. And the analogy that I draw is with footy. I love my footy. Okay, Pete and I might have gone to the odd game together to watch the Eagles. We next year, Yokai Wallach. Right? That's come on, Eagles. Um, let's. We live in hope. Um, but one of the things that footballers talk about is going to a destination club, a club where they feel that they're going to be successful, the leadership and the culture's great, they've got world-class facilities, they value families, and they think that their careers are going to flourish, right? I want WA to be that place where people want to stay here because it's a great place. We know it's a great place, but also a magnet to attract the unbelievably talented creative class who are going to make this place even better. So. What are some of the features at, uh, for a destination state? WA is known for being safe, friendly, tolerant, green, clean, low sovereign risk, well regulated. You know, we probably don't appreciate it until we go away and look back in and see, this is a pretty cool place. If you look at the global indices for livability, we're fifth in the world, health, 10th in the world, happiness, 15th in the world. You know, these are all very uh, great indices of what a great place this is to be. 
One of the things I think we need to do is to challenge ourselves a little bit more and to embrace change and be open to opportunities. I think we're, and as I'll explain a little bit later, in a bit of a comfort zone. We need to do, to do that. I think we need to have really long-term visionary plans. The state has developed a 20-year infrastructure plan. That is phenomenal. I've not heard of uh, uh, the state doing something that's out two decades. And the Premier has talked about, Premier Roger Cook uh, has talked about WA being a green energy superpower. Now we're starting to see the beginnings of some real vision as to where this state can go. But like sport, the global competition for talent is fierce and we need to be at the front of the pack to attract them. So what are some of the features that I see for a destination state? By the end of this decade, I'd love WA to be the place that everyone wants, comes, wants to come to because it's, it's creative, it's cohesive, it's clever, it's courageous, it's compassionate, it's curious, and it's confident. Now who knows what that, all those C's mean? Alliteration. Did anyone do, oh sorry, there are, there are those out there who are nodding at the alliteration. So those are sort of the features that I think we'd love our society to be. Can anyone disagree with any of that? Or would anyone throw in another C? See me later. Um, so I've been hanging around with a group of uh, reprobates. Uh, uh, I call them a cabal of malcontents who've been frustrated with slow pace of change in WA. And we've, we've formed a little group called WA Plus. WA is a great place. The plus is what else it could be. So let's just take a step back. And uh, Pete and I are probably the only people in the room, well, John Barrington might be as well, um, who were around for the first industrial revolution. <laughs> was, that, was, that, was that a bit nasty? <laughs> you, you can handle that? Yes. Okay, I'll buy you a beer afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two then. Um, so in the, we are going through the third and the fourth industrial revolutions right now. So the first one is, let's say, the mid-1700s, second one, mid-1800s, and now we're going through the third and the fourth industrial revolutions. The world has never changed at a faster pace than it is right now. If your head's spinning, you've got every reason to, 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 to understand why, because the pace of change has just been phenomenal and it doesn't look like it's slowing down. So here is um, a, a diagram that I took from um, a, a wonderful document by a think tank called Rethink X. And being the geek that I am, this is something that I read over summer. You know, most people read their crime novels or whatever. I read this document called Rethinking Humanity. It's, it's a fabulous document because it looks at the history of hu humanity and society and where we're at now. And the view of this think tank is that we're about to enter the most disruptive decade in human history. Now, this is the line that I'd like to leave with you. The narrow, linear mindsets blind us to the emerging possibilities. Now, if you go over to the, to the diagram itself, you can see that there are these bubbles, energy, transport, information, blah, blah, blah. These are sectors that we have normally thought of in silos, but in actual fact, they are all interlinked. As an Aboriginal culture, everything is connected. And the world that we're in now is unbelievably connected. So we have to th not think in linear terms anymore. We need to be thinking in terms in systems. Because if you just press one button, you don't just get an outcome. There's all sorts of other ramifications. And we need to be uh, alert to all of those. So our mindsets really must embrace change rather than fear it. And it's a bit like surfing a tsunami, is the way that they describe it. And speaking of tsunamis, this is a wave called the right. It's down near Walpole, and that's me sort of just coming down the face there. I, get, I, I always get annoyed when people chuckle when, when I say that's me, because no one believes that I actually, I don't surf that size wave, but I still try and go out for a paddle. Um, the reason for putting this, this uh, wave up is for a couple of reasons. One, it's a West Australian wave. We have surfing as part of our culture. And this is a monumental wave which really challenges your courage. Are you prepared to ride the wave or will you sit out the back and avoid it? Or when you are fearful and you've ridden the wave and it smashes you and you get caught up in the white water, there is a fine line 
And that's the fine line that we need to tread. We need to have the courage to be able to ride this tsunami of change that's coming and not just sit back and go, nah, we're not going to do it. We're not going to have a crack at that. I was fortunate to be at a UWA dinner in London uh, in 2018 when Lord Alec Rowers, who was the uh, Vice Chancellor of Cur of Curtin. <laughs> that was a faux pas. <laughs> Cambridge. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm not allowed in Curtin these days. <laughs> but that's another matter. <laughs> um, so it's so late. Lord Alec Browers um, gave this after dinner speech, and it was phenomenal. Um, he's, he's he's a world class engineer, part of the House of Lords. You know. The, the two sentences that just absolutely stuck in my mind were the, the two that I've got up there. The technological revolution has been swift and the pace unrelenting. No one would doubt that, right? We're all ahead of spinning. The second bit's the bit that is quite chilling. Nations that fail to keep up are doomed to become part of a second world. And the reason, there's a reason why I've put that in there, because I want to show you some stats that I find rather worrying. So let's just look at what happens when you have an industrial revolution and where does energy fit into all of this? So in the first industrial revolution, we went from essentially wood, that's the, uh, the, the, the brown bit at the top there as, a, as an energy source, and you can see coal as the black bit at the bottom, right? Everyone remembers steam engines and all that sort of stuff, steam locomotives. We went to a more dense form of energy, which is steam. But see how long it took for coal really to take off. In that period, the UK, the first industrial revolution was essentially in the UK. They were a superpower. They maintained their superpower status by being first movers in that area. Energy control, energy security, energy power. Go to the second industrial revolution and you can see where, you know, the brown bit, the, the wood's coming down, uh, there's the coal still up there. Then you've got the blue and the yellow bits coming in. That's oil and gas. And that was part of the change in the second industrial revolution. And that was the time when the US became a superpower. After the Civil War, they were really struggling as a nation. They came together and they found oil and gas. And that turned America into a superpower because of the energy control that they had. Fast forward to where we are now, and you can see right at the very end there's a little bit of green and a little bit of Red. Red's nuclear, not going anywhere. Green is the renewables. You can see there's a slight upturn. This is a moment when we're going to go to a new form of energy, and he who controls the energy is going to be in a very, very powerful geopolitical position. And this next slide highlights that this has come from the International Renewable Energy Agency. And you can see the, the blue line there is fossil fuels. They reckon that that will peak. Uh, around about 2030, fossil fuel usage will go down, and you can see how renewables are going to take off. And by 2050, they'll be overlapping, and the renewables will continue. Right? This is a trend that's quite uh, well accepted these days. Associated with that, and so there are a couple of quotes there, will be changes in geopolitics and power. If we get this right in, in Australia, we have the opportunity to become a green energy superpower, and we will set ourselves up as a nation for the next 50 to 100 years. This is a pivotal moment for, for us as a, as, as, as a country. So where does WA stand at the moment? This is a, a diagram that shows that um, Western Australia uh, relies heavily on the resource sector. Uh, the, the top bar is iron ore. 60% of our exports are in iron ore, of which 80% goes to China. So we have an export profile essentially around one product, one commodity going to one destination. Right? Think about that for a second. Sounds good and things are going well. But it also puts you at risk if things aren't going well. We need to absolutely make sure that we build on this and diversify our economies so that we can take advantage of other opportunities. So you can see that 90% plus of Australia's export, uh, Western Australia's exports are in the resource sector, which then leads to this potential phenomenon. 
We got through COVID all right, but it's a worry for me that we might have caught the Dutch disease. Anyone from the Netherlands here? Uh, yes? No? Oh, um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak openly then. Um, in, in, the, in the late 1950s, um, Holland, the, the, the Netherlands, discovered oil and gas in a field called Groningen. And they found what happened there was, great, you're beauty, we've found all this oil and gas, we're going to be really wealthy, eh, eh, all good. And what they found was that a lot of the finance, a lot of the talent, well, all got sucked into that particular resource. Other areas then got drained and their economy actually stalled despite the fact that they'd found this incredible deposit of a natural resource. So here in Western Australia, we need to be very mindful that we are a resource rich state, but we need to make sure that we don't end up catching the Dutch disease. Some of the features of the Dutch disease, it's also known as the paradox of plenty or the natural resources curse. It gets dependent on commodity price fluctuations. And yeah, price of iron ore has gone up, price of iron ore has gone down, LNG has gone up, LNG has gone down. If you go back seven years, two years into my term as chief scientist, uh, the, the, the price of iron ore dropped down to $40 uh, a tonne, uh, LNG went down to $40 a barrel, uh, we had GST problems, suddenly the whole economy collapsed. Western Australia was in, in, was in big trouble. So we have to be aware that you know, there are these massive fluctuations and how do we smooth them out? Governments therefore can get trapped into uh, boom-bust cycles, which makes it very difficult for them to plan. Diversification of the economy gets neglected because the money is just rolling in. Every time a boatload of iron ore goes offshore, ka-ching, money's coming into the coffers. So there isn't that burning platform to make sure that we are on the cutting edge. Two things that I'm just drawing your attention to here. One is that manufacturing suffers as a consequence of resource-rich states and education often suffers. And those are two areas that I don't think we really want to see happening. You can be comfortable where you are. If you're comfortable, you're close to complacent. If you're complacent, you're close to uncompetitive. So we need to be very mindful of where we're sitting in all of this. And this is a, another geeky thing that I've read, uh, where this think tank uh, coming out of Canberra have said, Australia is a complacent nation. Our reactions are too little, too late, and too short-sighted. So we need to really make sure that we, we heed these sorts of messages. Part of the reason uh, for those comments is, 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 is in this diagram. Australia, this is the Harvard Atlas of Economic Complexity. How complex are the products that you sell when you export things overseas? Are they you know, sophisticated manufacturing or are they rocks and crops? Well, Harvard says that Australia has a profoundly simple economy and is highly exposed to very limited exports. So if you look at the, 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 the diagram there, you can see Australia there in red. And over the past 30, 40 years, we've gone backwards. We were somewhere in the mid 40s. Globally, we're down uh, in the, in, this was a few years ago. So we were 86 in the world between Paraguay and Uzbekistan. This year, we're 93 in the world. Uh, we're, we're between Pakistan and Uganda. But the good news is we've, rack, we've, we've rocketed up from 97 last year when we were between Kazakhstan and Burkina Faso. <laughs> now, seriously, is that, the, you know, that's where we're sitting, folks, right? We are a, G, well, a G20 country with the 13th largest economy on the planet, and we sit in the, in, you know, the low 90s, in the 90s, in terms of economic complexity. That's not good. So let's have a look at manufacturing then. What's our manufacturing status like? The, the bar and the, 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 the mountain diagram in the middle there shows you that at the time of federation, when Australia was riding the sheep's back, 10% roughly of the economy was in manufacturing. That increased over the subsequent 50 years, 60 years, and it reached a peak of nearly 30% of our economy. And look what's happened since the 1960s. Our manufacturing capability has dropped down to the same level it was at the beginning of, the, of Federation. And you can actually draw a parallel between that and the rise of the resource sector. All right, so where we've generated a lot of wealth out of our resource sector, 
we've seen a decrease in manufacturing. The other worrying thing is if you look at our education system, I'm not a great fan of PISA and NAPLAN and all those sorts of uh, indices, but they do give you an, an idea. And if you're looking at that graph, you can see the trends are not heading in the right direction. That's not due to lack of funding. That's not due to a, reduced, a reduction in funding because the funding has actually gone up in that period. So two of the worries that you, you see in the Dutch disease, decreases in manufacturing, decreases in education, are prevalent in Australia. So this is our big moment in my view. Uh, we're seen as a dig and grow economy. We do rocks, we do crops. And when I came into this job, I was told we take big rocks, we turn them into little rocks, and we put them on a ship. That's what we do. That's what we're good at, and that's what we're going to stick to. And th th that's absolutely right. We are incredibly good. We're the best resource jurisdiction on the planet, but we're so much more than that. And we've got more capability to do a whole lot of other things. And I believe we've got a whole bunch of world-leading capabilities that I'll talk about now that will propel us into this new world that I see. I believe this is our Steve Bradbury moment. Everyone remember Steve Bradbury? You know, so I put the little WA logo on there for Steve. So this is our moment when, you know, everyone's going around the corner for the final bend and Steve's lagging at the back of the field. Everyone collapses and he just scoots past. Um, if we get our settings right, I believe that we will set ourselves up for a prosperous, harmonious, cohesive, confident uh, state for the next 100 years. So, mineral wealth. This, this is for the geeks in the... <laughs> Anyone know what this is called? It's, I hope some of you do. It's the periodic table, right? You can tell I was a chemistry teacher. Um, <laughs> there are 103 elements on this periodic table, of which 69 are found in WA. The ones in pink are those that are actually being mined right now. The ones in pale blue is where we've got potential to mine them. So two thirds of all the elements on the periodic table exist in one jurisdiction, Western Australia. There is no other place on the planet that's got that resource wealth. Phenomenal. And here are some of the, the, the sites that are, not, I've put aside uh, iron ore and, and all those other, you know, gold and what have you. I've just shown the critical minerals like lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, vanadium, rare earths, copper. And those are all the mines all through Western Australia, right? We are unbelievably blessed. So I think that what we have here is this incredible opportunity to go beyond just mineral extraction. So currently in 2023, we do iron ore, aluminum, etc. We dig them up, turn them into little rocks and tend to put them on a ship. Right? I think by 2030, we'll, if we get our settings right, that we will be making green iron or green steel and green aluminum. We have this massive opportunity in front of us right now. Steel production globally generates 8% of all CO, oh, greenhouse gas emissions. So if we can decarbonize and actually make green iron and green steel here in WA, we will be doing this, it's not just a great service for Western Australia, we will be doing a global service by reducing carbon emissions. We're starting to see the first signs of downstream processing. Western Australia is now making lithium hydroxide, nickel sulfate, and so we can go down to the next step, which is making precursor cathode materials. The next step then is battery production. And you know, we're starting to see a move back towards manufacturing. I'm excited by those prospects because battery manufacturing, to me, is something that we should do. We should have sovereign capability in that because I relate that to the equivalent of the Snowy 2.0 scheme. Snowy 2.0 is, is it's an ESS. It's an energy storage system. It's a static energy storage system. It's like a dirty group of battery that can't move. If we make our own batteries, they will be deployable and we can take them out to Widji Maltha, we can take them out to Bruce Rock, we can take them out to any mine, and, but we're making them ourselves. So this to me is something that uh, we should be doing uh, as, as a nation. And Ross Garno, who is uh, one of the country's eminent uh, economists, has put out a book just actually during COVID 
calling Australia superpower, Australia's great low carbon opportunity. And he says Australia's natural resources in renewable energy are, su are superior to any developed country. And we have immense opportunities in capturing and sequestering carbon in soil, pastures, woodlands, and also geo sequestration underground. Let's have a look at some of the evidence for that statement. Here is uh, a, a diagram that looks globally at where the best solar opportunities are and where the best wind opportunities are. So um, wind, uh, which one's which? Um, wind is in blue and solar is in green. The one thing that stands out from all of this is that one place has got both of them, Australia. Right? It's the only place, apart from a little bit in South Africa and a little bit in Argentina, Australia just stands out as the place to do renewals. And even better than that for us West Australians is that if you look at the heat map, the solar potential, the best place is in the northwest of WA. The best wind in the country is in the southwest of WA. And you've got a sweet spot in between in the Midwest, where you've got really incredible solar and wind potential. Couple that with geothermal potential, when geothermal energy becomes a, 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 a viable source, an economically viable source, we have, on that map on the right-hand side there, enormous geothermal potential as well. We also have a coastline of 14,000 kilometres. So when wave power becomes viable, we can tap into that. And when tidal power becomes viable, we've got the Northwest. So we are simply the best jurisdiction in the world to have that suite of renewable resources in front of us. I can't think of another jurisdiction like it. So it's our responsibility to make sure we tap into it and make the most of this. So where, does that, so where do we sit right now? We're going through an energy transition, and if we look at just the electricity in the Southwest grid, Currently, it's about a third coal, a third natural gas, and a third renewables. We're shutting down our coal-fired stations by 2030. They're getting old. Great decision. Right? I don't think anyone would deny that. We've got natural gas, and Western Australia, thanks to a decision made by Alan Carpenter when he was Premier, retained 15% of gas for domestic consumption. So it wasn't all exported. He was pilloried, pilloried mercilessly when he made that decision by the people on the East Coast. Now, what's happened over the last few years when the East Coast has run out of gas? They go, maybe that decision by those cowboys out west wasn't so crazy after all. And we have Alan Carpenter to thank for making that very, very strong, bold decision. That's a legacy that this state needs to be appreciative of. Um, we have about a third of our current uh, electricity is coming from solar, rooftop, solar farms, uh, wind, we've got wind farms. The opportunity for offshore wind farms now is immense. And we should be looking at that very seriously as well. So I can't think of a better jurisdiction in the world to do an orderly transition from fossil fuels towards renewables because we're shutting down coal, we've got gas in the interim, and we move towards renewables. This is the place to do it. And one thing we need to realise is that batteries will not be the sole solution for when the sun's not shining and when the wind's not blowing. Batteries are for short-term storage. We need to find long-term storage solutions. We can't do pumped hydro because we're flat and we don't have a lot of water. All right, so we need to find something else. Um, but that's an opportunity for research. So here are some of the, you've all been hearing about hydrogen. It feels like a gold rush. Everyone's out there at the moment, you know, saying, oh, we've got a deal for you. We've got green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. Here are all the projects that are going on around the state right now. There's at least 30 or 40 projects, and they're growing by the day. This is a really very interesting opportunity for the, for, for the state because it's, it's anticipated by 2050 that between 10 and 20 percent of global energy will be coming from hydrogen. So we're very well placed to participate in that. And that conveniently links up where we've got strategic industrial areas. So if we go back, see where the, the hydrogen's mapping around the coast, and look at the strategic uh, industrial areas, we've got ports, rail, etc. they overlap. We are well placed to take advantage of this. We also have the opportunity to sequester carbon, right? That's to either do that by biosequestration, which is 
to trap carbon dioxide on land or at sea. On land, it could be regenerative agriculture, reforestation, and so on. At sea, it's called blue carbon, where you grow mangroves, seagrass, and so on. Grow those things, trap the carbon dioxide. We also have great opportunities in two other areas. One is to pump it underground, geo sequestration. And in Western Australia's case, if, if you look at the deep saline formation there in the middle, we have some great opportunities to pump CO2 underground there. But also, with our natural gas fields depleting, they're empty. Let's do reverse engineering and pump CO2 into those empty wells. What a great opportunity. And finally, you can actually turn carbon dioxide into something that's not just evil, but into something that could be good. You can actually make products out of it, cement and so on. I know that there are companies out there uh, that are trying to make protein out of the CO2. And you go, oh, that's interesting. So there's, there's this world-leading opportunity number two, the energy transition. We've got all of these incredible resources in front of us right now. We need to tap into them, become a global centre for clean energy, a hydrogen producer, We'll, we will then have energy security. Without energy security, folks, everything else collapses in our society. We don't have lights, we don't have water, we don't have hospitals, we don't have schools, we don't have food, we don't have water. And I link water because it's in Western Australia, at the moment, two thirds of our drinking water comes from desalination plants, energy intensive. The remaining 20 odd percent uh, comes from aquifers, which we have to pump up, you need energy. Only 5 to 10% of our drinking water comes from our dams these days. So energy is intimately linked with water and survival on this, uh, in, in this state. OK, so here is, what was the state doing about it? The state is trying to diversify and decarbonise at the same time. Two major challenges to, tr to transform the economy. And it's got lots and lots of really good uh, uh, strategies and plans around them. Here's just a, a couple of them. but. Unless you take a systems view, they're going to be working in isolation. And I'm sorry this is a really crazy, busy slide, but what I'm just trying to highlight here is if you're going to do an orderly transition to a renewable future, these are all the elements that you need to take into consideration to make sure that you haven't left something out or missed an opportunity. It's complex. It's challenging. There isn't another place in the world that's got the set of the suite of uh, the resources that we've got to take advantage of this. What we need to do is to make sure that we try and join all these dots and take advantage of this renewable opportunity. So here's an example of cross-sector technology development. We've got a fantastic resource sector. Part of it has been built on, or a, lot, a big part of it, has been built on the incredible technology that has been developed here in Western Australia. On the left-hand side, at the top left-hand side, are remote operations. So you can see a guy behind the screen there. And we have half a dozen remote operation centres in Western Australia that are the equivalent of the Johnson Space Centre in Houston. They are running mines, offshore oil rigs, underwater uh, um, robots from the CBD. 2,000 kilometres away, being run from here. Right? That is technology that is developed here. There are more ex-NASA people working in WA than anywhere else in the world. And you ask somebody like Jason Cruzon, who is the senior vice president uh, at Woodside, um, why did, you know, he was ex-NASA. So, Jason, why did, why did you come out to WA? He said, I wanted to be at the world center of remote operations. You do this better than NASA. And they want to go back to the moon? They come in to talk to us. Very interesting. So, out of all of this, we have developed some remarkable technology that most people wouldn't know about. That then leads into the, the, the next panel in the middle, which is Western Australia's remoteness. And we have more ground stations, these de degraded satellite dishes. We're a great place for satellite information coming down. We gets collected and then disseminated. We have the world's largest radio telescope being built in our backyard, the square kilometre array. That's those crazy, funky uh, Christmas trees, metallic Christmas trees on the right hand side over there. <laughs> But to, ha to handle all the data that's going to come out of the square kilometre array, and when that finally gets turned on in a few years' time, the volume of data that's going to be released when that goes ka you know, pull the, pull the lever, is going to be the equivalent of every bit of information on the internet right now. 
So think of that information volume that's going to be screaming down from the Murchison down to the Pawsey supercomputer, which is purposely built to handle all of that information. So we have massive supercomputing capability here in WA. The Pawsey supercomputer is now the 15th most powerful in the world. The one next to it, uh, this guy here, is uh, if you go down to the corner of Thomas Street and Kings Park Road, you'll, you'll see a sign down under Geo Solutions that is an equivalent sized supercomputer in there called Bruce. <laughs> Why wouldn't you call it Bruce? Right? Um, but you know, we have massive supercomputing capability here in WA, which leads then into AI, laser comms, quantum, and so on, and decarbonisation. So you can see, by linking all of these different sectors, you can do some phenomenal things. So that leads into my, my next big dream, which is to see the remote operations, the advanced robotics, the auto what's the biggest robot in the world, folks? Anyone know? Rio Tinto's automated train. Five kilometers long. That's a robot. All right, it's been driven autonomously from Perth. It's in our backyard. Um, so we, we've done extremely well in all those areas and advanced manufacturing is something that goes under the radar. Austal ships. Anyone from Austal here today? No? no. Um, Austal ships in, in Henderson make roughly 10% of the US Navy. Now just think about that for a minute. The US Navy, you know, take their craft pretty seriously. All right, life and death type stuff. So they're entrusting a, a company at the other end of the planet to make 10% of their ships. And it's not because, you know, they're just altruistic. It's because they are really good. So, you know, by 2030, you could see how all of those capabilities could be turned into something spectacular. I'd love us to be a, a, a centre for remote ops where we could be running mines in Africa, South America, Mongolia, whatever. But we could also be running hospitals. We could be having uh, monitoring of hospitals in Indonesia from Perth. So that technology can be spread into a number of different areas. Education. I think we've got a very solid education sector. Could be better. All right, I think there's, uh, there's scope for improvement across the board. And I'm not just talking about universities, um, but I will. And uh, I, as I showed you with those graphs a little bit earlier, uh, I'm worried about the trends that we're seeing across the education sector. So you might have heard me talking about uh, university <coughs> amalgamations. And this is, this is a, the stat that worries me. And this is what really uh, caught my attention when I started looking at this. Uh, I was asked to have a look at this uh, early on in my tenure as, as chief scientist. So focus on the blue line for a second. The blue line in all of those three graphs, we've got Western Australia, South Australia, and Victoria. The blue line is percentage of our population, uh, of the nation's population. So Western Australia's got about 10% of the nation's population. South Australia's got six or seven. Victoria's about 25%. If you look at international students, if you look at competitive grants in ARC, in NH and MRC, which are the uh, orange, grey and yellow bars. In Western Australia, they're all below the blue line and they're heading in the wrong direction. If you're looking at South Australia, they're flatlining it. It's all much the same. If you're looking at Victoria, they're all above the blue line. Right, so Victoria calls itself the education state for good reason. It attracts a third of Australia's international students. It's getting up to nearly 50% of Australia's NHMRC grants and so on. So, you know, for me, this is a worrying trend. And if you're looking at the number of academics in Western Australia, there are four... Um, uh, public universities on the right-hand side there in orange. If you were to add them all up, if all the academics in the four universities, that becomes that black bar on the far right, and that's the equivalent of the University of Queensland or New South Wales or Sydney, just a single university. So all of our academics together would be the equivalent of one of those big five universities. The other stat that worries me is 
when you look at the high citation researchers who are the rock stars of research. And in WA, if you add them all up, this is a little bit out of date. I was told by Clarivate, the company that does this, they've got a new set of data that's coming up. Um, in WA, we've got 20, we had 22 high size of these high citation researchers, which is half the University of Queensland, half of Melbourne, and so on. So we've got an issue in making sure that we've got sufficient talent and high caliber talent in WA. And so places like the Perkins are crucial because they are beacons to attract talent. And there was a university sector review that was conducted recently, and essentially they've come up with the, the same conclusions that I have, that Western Australia is struggling uh, in terms of growth uh, uh, with uh, attracting students, uh, overseas enrolments, and decline in, in, in research funding. WA needs to keep pace. So this is a continuation of, of that, uh, uh, that, the panel's uh, uh, commentary. Um, we really need to make sure that this is a vibrant, vital sector for the state. So let's move on to another area which is very relevant to this particular organisation. Uh, in Western Australia, we're very good at agriculture. We've done very well. Harry was one of the great leaders. He did the Nuffield Fellowship and came back to Western Australia with a whole bunch of new ideas which have been transmitted throughout the agricultural sector and were incredibly transformative. But we have unique biodiversity. We are a biodiversity hotspot on land and at sea. We're one of 14 global biodiversity hotspots. We've got plants, bugs, slugs, you name it, that don't exist anywhere else in the world. We haven't tapped into what they've got to offer. We value our geology, we'll tap into our rocks, but we haven't really tapped into our biology. And we've got wonderful biomedical expertise in this state. So I see a bright future in the ability to tap into our biodiversity, Perkins being one of the organisations that does this, to say we can have a new antiviral, we can have a new antibacterial, we can have a new anti-cancer drug coming out of our unique bio. And I know this is a fact because I've actually seen some of the data. We have a compound that Gavin Flametti at UWA pulled out um, uh, that has got potent anti-coronaviral uh, activity. We have uh, drugs that have come from sponges, which have got potent anti-cancer activity. And Pete, you, what your famous green goo, you know, that, that was anti-cancer activity as well. So, you know, there's this massive opportunity in, in this area as well. Um, indigenous culture, something that I'm, you, know, you might have picked up that I'm a bit passionate about. Uh, as Shaz said, you know, it's the oldest continuous culture here on the planet with deep knowledge and wisdom. And Western Australia, it, it's not really well known that we have native title settlements with the Noongar people in the southwest with the Yamaji people in the Midwest, and these are the closest things to treaties anywhere in the country. And by 2030, I would love it if the whole state was, was in that same position, and we've reached a point of having a treaty with each of the different uh, groups uh, across, uh, across WA. So by 2030, Danger Kulin, a wonderful group, means walking together. Um, we can learn so much from the elders about truth-telling, reconciliation, we can have an uh, wonderful uh, cultural centre that's, uh, that's being talked about now. Indigenous tourism is something that people are screaming out for. And I think there's an opportunity to tap into the wonderful deep knowledge that Aboriginal people have around the herbs, the plants, the slugs and so on, and to protect their IP. So there's legislation that's going through Parliament right now. No, not, not right now, it's being developed to go through Parliament next year that says Australia, Western Australia is going to look after its biodiversity, but we're going to protect the rights of Aboriginal people to make sure that their IP is protected and that they get the benefits for saying, if that resin from the bark of the, the Maori tree has got uh, potential to cure lung disease, it's theirs, and they get the benefits from it. All right? That's what the legislation is, is being proposed to do. So finally, you know, this is not a bad place to live, uh, as we all know, by 2030, I would love us to be seen as this creative, innovative society that's going to be an, a beacon, that's going to attract the creative class. We're going to have 
music, arts, film, theatre, dance, food, wine, etc. All of those wonderful, cool things. And people go, you know what? There's something happening in Perth. There's something in the water. I want to be there. Why not? But equally importantly, in my view, to attracting all of those bright, funky, cool people <coughs> is to make sure that as we go along this journey, this most rapid period of change ever in human history, we don't leave people behind. And at the moment, that umbilical cord is getting stretched. We're getting to a point where we have the haves and the have-nots, those that are participants in this incredible journey who are getting very excited, a bit like me, and there are people who are feeling marginalised and very fearful because they can't see how they can participate. As a wealthy, privileged society, it is incumbent upon us to make sure we bring everybody along and we leave no one behind. So there it is, there's the state for you. Yeah, in one, one page, right? The, four, the, the key areas, right? Don't try and read it, <laughs> right? But it just tries to highlight, we've got some really good comparative advantages. What we need to do is to make sure we turn them into competitive advantages so that the state prospers over the next 50 to 100 years. We need a new narrative. We need to just actually be proud and confident in what we're doing. We need to celebrate the sophistication and science and technology and innovation that goes on in this state. We need to celebrate our creativity, our indigenous culture, and to embrace these exciting new opportunities. We need to be bold, right? We need to be visionary and be prepared to have a crack, take a risk. So this is our moment to become a destination state. It's a pivotal moment because the world is changing so rapidly. We're blessed, but we have to seize the day. We cannot afford to go, oh, yeah, let's just think about that a little bit, you know? Mm, yeah. The world's moving too rapidly, and if we don't seize this moment, future generations will look back on us and go, how the hell did you manage to stuff that up? Right? Because we are so blessed. We need that sense of urgency to protect the future for, uh, for our future generations. So the decisions we make right now, and this is a key moment, a binary in my view, we grasp the opportunities, poof, we take off. If we do business as usual, should be right, mate, we go backwards. It's a slow, inexorable, painful decline. And that's not something that we want our kids, grandkids, and their kids to, to face. This is a time to be bold, not to be timid, and to be making sure that we ride that tsunami, that we go down to the right down at Walpole, and we've got the guts to actually take on that wave, ride it, and come out the other end exhilarated. This is a time to say, have a go, mate. Not, she'll be right, mate. Thank you.